All right. Good morning, everybody. Just adjust things here. So thanks for coming. We'll get started shortly. As usual, we'll just wait a couple of minutes, see how many people show up today. Kind of an interesting subject, so um, I would expect a couple of people rolling in to ask a few questions. Kind of a debacle in the VXX thing. Um, it actually went off, I would say, normal. We'll get into that. But I can certainly understand why it was very confusing for a lot of people. So um, apologies. Check I'm on the right microphone. And um, I do have a new camera. So for all you tech geeks out there, just like me, um, finally, it was on back order for months, and I finally got it. So I've got the Sony a7S III and the Tamron 17 to 28 mil f 2.8 lens so if anybody's curious and uh, i travel a lot i'm always in different rooms different size rooms before i was using a 24 mil and so basically it has to be the exact same distance i'm pretty excited about this i can kind of switch the distances up a little bit maybe i can do a couple of streams outside or we'll see how things go but uh, hopefully everybody can see it clearly hopefully the settings are all right and um, there's a few questions in the chat here um, as, as we're rolling in, I'll just uh, answer this one here. It's just caught my eye. Everybody knows I'm a huge UFC fan. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Chris Weidman was in a fight. It, it was really one of the most bizarre things you'll ever see in any sport. So I've been watching the UFC literally since UFC 1. My friend had a satellite TV way back in the day, 1993. And so we caught the very first one, and I've seen every single UFC since. And in all that time, I believe there's been three people who have had this injury. And I'm not even going to describe it. It was, it was pretty horrible. You don't want to see it. If you're squeamish around injuries, you don't want to see it. But it's only happened three times ever. And um, Anderson Silva was the most famous one. He actually lost a fight due to this injury. And the guy that he kicked was named Chris Weidman, and that was 10 years ago. Just in a bizarre twist of fate, irony, whatever you want to call it, um, identical injury to the guy that originally got kicked. Now he's the one that did the kick. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, the world is, I mean, I don't believe in fate and karma and curses and whatnot, of course, but boy, it, it makes you wonder. So um, yeah, that was, that was really rough to see. So thanks everybody for coming in. Um, I'm just gonna go over a brief rundown of what we're going to be talking about, just so you have a little bit of a heads up. And uh, the first thing, of course, is that UVXY, it does appear, and I say appear because there's a little bit of confusion, but it does appear like the reverse split is imminent at this point. Uh, we'll get into that first, and then I'll very quickly touch on how the shares are adjusted, how the options get adjusted. We've done this already for VXX, that was a couple weeks ago, and now it seems we're gonna do the same thing for UVXY, we'll get into that. This number four is probably going to be quite interesting to people. So what I did is we have a, basically a VTS live stream live account that I funded. And so I can actually show people live trades and we can really go through some things. And I took screenshots before the split and after the split in the VXX in the options market. So I'm actually going to show you those screenshots show you what it looked like, explain all the confusion around, you know, people thought that their money was stolen from them, that the, the, the option gods have taken everything from them and it's not fair, should there be, you know, corporate lawsuits. So I'm going to go through all of that with some screenshots and then I will wrap it up with giving you some tips on how to successfully trade through reverse splits because while they don't happen often, they do happen and we need to be aware of what it looks like, how to navigate the space, just so you don't lose money on those trades. Technically, as you probably know, nothing is lost, but if you do it wrong, there are definitely ways to lose money. So I'm gonna give you some tips on how to avoid that. So let me do a quick little housekeeping, one minute intro, get your coffee ready, and then we're gonna start right away. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff, I'm a Canadian, and I'm a former professional golfer, so you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel, so you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started.
If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email, every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so um, just a quick reminder before we get started. Of course, I am on all the social media, the LinkedIn, Facebook, and all that stuff. But if you do want to be notified of certain things like live streams, like reverse splits in the volatility ETPs, any type of crazy market action, you definitely want to follow me on Twitter because um, while I don't love the platform, I think that Twitter, you got to be real careful who you follow. There's a lot of people pretending to be experts in things they are not, but it's probably the easiest social media platform to actually notify people of things. So there's the, the handle there, at Volatility Vix. Give me a quick follow on Twitter so you don't miss anything. So with that, let's get into the first point, which is this whole UVXY reverse split nonsense. So now you see a chart of the UVXY here. We'll pull that up. We've all been waiting, let's say patiently, for this thing to reverse split. All these circles are just, I like to track how often the monthly option cycles expire in or out of the money. But this is the UVXY over the last one year. We've all figured that the reverse split is coming imminently. And it's been a little bit frustrating, just the lack of announcements and just, just the terrible rollout of this thing. So let's make sure that's muted there. There we go. Um, this is the announcement for the reverse split of UVXY. And and let's just say it for what it is. This is the worst announcement I've probably ever seen. The first thing that's wrong, of course, is the dates. Um, this is on April 22nd, but they got the date wrong. It says January 6th on it. Um, there's all kinds of mistakes here. It says 10 ETFs will reverse split, but you know there's a good 16 of them that are doing reverse splits. Down here, it says that there's two, I believe. It said something like that that there's two, e there's two ETFs that will forward split. Well, there's actually several more down here that are gonna forward split. All of these are gonna forward split. So whatever's going on here, this looks like it was written by somebody, you know, on their laptop, two in the morning, half asleep watching a movie on Netflix, and they just went into work the next day, handed it in, and somebody put it out there. They didn't proofread it, they didn't do any of it. But essentially, we are, sort of somewhat expecting a UVXY reverse split here. It's going to be a one to 10, and it's pretty much a guess at this point. Like I said, follow me on Twitter. I will keep up to date on this, but I'm guessing that it's gonna be May 6th. I'm just thinking that typically they give a two week heads up. This was on 422, so let's just say, I don't know, 422, two weeks exactly would be May 6th. So let's just guess that at some time late next week, don't be surprised if the UVXY reverse splits. I certainly hope that they clarify all of this because even if you go to the ProShares website, there's nothing, right? There, it's just terrible. You can go to news, there's no news announcements. If you go to announcements, there's nothing. They, they K1 for a different crude oil strategy. If you go to press releases, it is here. It says January 6th, it was announced, but it's the same garbage presentation that was before that this is all wrong so just know that probably where's my uh probably next week i'm guessing the uvxy will finally do that one to ten reverse split now we can look at the split history here a lot of people were thinking well when do these typically happen this is the uvxy split history again this is a guess 
don't don't quote me on this. I have no idea what's going on, but I will try to find out. Um, this is going to be the tenth reverse split that the UVXY has done. Now remember that in February of 2018, the UVXY deleveraged from a two times product from 2011 when it launched all the way to Volpocalypse in 2018. It was a two times leverage product, just like the TVX. But since February 2018, this will be the second reverse split when the thing is a 1.5 times leverage factor. But you can see the prices. Typically, they get in the, you know, below eight, below seven. I would imagine this happened just simply because the price spiked up after they did the announcement. But probably we're looking for a reverse split quite soon. Now, um, let me just scroll over here. People might be wondering why they do these reverse splits at all. Well, you probably, if you've seen the charts, long-term charts, there's VXX. Here's a long-term chart of the UVXY. It's easier to look at when it is a log scale. This is why they need to do reverse splits because as we know, due to the structure of the product, how it tracks the front two months of the VIX futures term structure, the fact that the VIX futures are in contango and there's positive roll yield with respect to the VIX index, these things typically decay. About 80% of the time, give or take, they are decaying downward. Now, they, they have huge spikes along the way, so this is beyond the scope of today's live stream, but definitely be very, very careful shorting these things. Don't think that you can just look at this and then just blindly short it and make money. Doesn't work that way. But they do need to split these things along the way, otherwise it would go to fractions of one penny. So that's what we're looking at, probably a one to 10 reverse split. My guess is, maybe next week. Um, again, I, I feel silly even saying that. We should know exactly. How do, you, how do you screw up an announcement this badly? I do not know. It's not like they're a small company. As you saw, they are doing this on several ETFs, some of them very, very big. You'd think they would have got it right. But anyway, what does a reverse split mean? Well, if you want the best video, I'm not gonna cover it actually in as much detail today because we already did this two weeks ago for the VXX. But if you go to the YouTube channel and you go to videos, the one that I would suggest is you watch this one that says XIV or VXX split. What does it mean for vol traders? Watch that one. Literally everything is identical in that video to today. It's just for the UVXY instead. So you can get all, all the information you need there. Another thing I will mention quickly, if you want to know why these things decay, when I said that they decayed long term and they go to fractions of pennies, if you're really unclear as to why that is, I would watch this video. It's called VIX Futures Expiration. It's really the only video you'll ever have to watch. I know it's 20 minutes long. It's a little bit boring, kind of technical. But if you want to know the answer to that question, it's all in there. And from that point forward, you'll know exactly how these products function. So we know what's going to happen, right? They take the UVXY price. It's about 450 right now, but let's just say for easy math, it's $5. It's $5, they do a one to 10 reverse split. All they need to do is take the price from $5 and put it at 50, right? They wanna do that so that it has room to continue decaying downward. But that's going to change the value of anybody holding it. So the next adjustment they make is they just divide the share count, the outstanding shares by 10, and then you 10 times the price, one tenth the shares, no value changes hands. If you are holding UVXY now or any time before the reverse split, nothing changes. After the reverse split, the value of your holding will be identical. Reverse splits do nothing, it's just a nominal number. And as we know, in the volatility space, it's even less meaningful. You know, sometimes people make a case that after a reverse split, the, the price thereafter might actually see some changes. Maybe there would be more interest in the product or maybe at a different price, it allows different people in. Whatever the reason, that does not apply to volatility ETPs. These track 100% exactly an underlying methodology. The price of the product is totally irrelevant. So no value will be lost. It will just be 10 times higher value, 10 times fewer shares, and that's it. The one thing that you wanna be aware of is in the options market, technically we can say the same thing. We can say that no value will change hands. You will not lose a penny if you have contracts that go through, nothing happens, but you do wanna be aware of several things. So that's why I wanna kinda of go through all of this today, prepare you for what it's going to look like because it is a little strange. 
So we are looking at the UVXY right here. See, it's trading at 449. If you look right here in this column, you can see it says 100 across the board, all of these weeklies. What that number means is with all option contracts, one contract is equivalent to 100 shares of the underlying. So one option contract in UVXY is equivalent to 100 shares of the ETF UVXY. And it says 100 across the board. Instead, in the options world of dividing the number of contracts and making it partial contracts, which is an absolute nightmare for clearing and whatnot, all they're going to do is keep these contracts the same. Everything will look the same. The strikes will be the same. The prices will be the same. They're just going to change this ratio to a 10 to 1 ratio. So instead of one option contract being 100 shares of the underline, all of these the day after will, will say 10 divided by 100, which represents now one option contract is 10 shares of the underline. And that will be in existence temporarily until these contracts expire. So you can keep them if you want. We'll get into why maybe you shouldn't, but you could keep them if you wanted and it's just a different exercise ratio for the time being. And then they'll just fill in the normal contracts as usual with the new price that will probably be around $45 and everything will look the same. So we can actually compare right now, conveniently we had a VXX reverse split. We can see it right now with our own eyes. The VXX reverse split was a one to four. So remember, this should have said 100s all the way down. Some of them say 25 over 100. That means that temporarily, this contract is now one contract representing 25 shares of the underline, not 100. That's the only change they need to make. And then it makes managing the options post split very, very simple. You don't have to clear partial shares. You don't have to cash settle anything. It is simply a different ratio. So what you will see the day before the split, you will see UVXY will say 100s all the way. The day after the split, it will all of them will say 10 divided by 100. And that just means that it's now a 1 to 10 ratio. And then over the next several days, you will start to see new contracts being represented that say 100 again. You can see them here. We're already on day two of the VXX post split, right? That happened, or day three actually. That happened last Thursday night. Friday morning, it said nothing but 25 over 100. Monday morning, these 100s showed up. This means that this is the old one for May, the 21st of May. These are all the people that hold these contracts. It's still open. It's still valid. You can keep it if you like. Again, I'll get into why you maybe don't want to, but here's the new one. It's exactly the same. It's just now the strikes are normal. They're representing the post split price. So that's all you're going to see. It's actually quite simple from the front end of the software perspective. The UVXY itself, 10 times the value, one tenth the shares. The options, instead of one to 100, it's one to 10. And that's really all you need to know. Reverse splits, don't do anything to your value. You're not going to lose your shares. I cannot tell you how many emails I got Friday morning. I'm gonna show you right now, point here number four, we're gonna do a post-mortem on that VXX reverse split. I had, I mean, not kidding, 30, 40 emails asking, did they steal my money? Is my money gone? Well, why were people thinking that? So Thursday night was the reverse split. Let's look at some of these screenshots that I took. But first of all, in order to, for this account to make sense, remember this is our live stream account. And um, all you need to really know about this account, I funded it when we started our live stream. So I just wanted to be able to demonstrate some live trades. So it was funded um, October 29th and we'll go to the updated value. So essentially this is the account. All you need to know is we'll find that night of the 22nd, this is the day of the reverse split. This account value set $199,830. So just remember that number, basically $200,000. Now, let me show you pre-market, let me close all these windows, pre-market, this is what it looked like. So you can see it says 6.22 a.m. Now I am in Vancouver right now, so this is Pacific time. That's essentially 9.22 New York time, eight minutes before the markets open. So markets are gonna be opening very soon. I took a screenshot. You can see the account value. It says 
491. That is way low. That is nearly $20,000 below what it was the night before. So obviously this can be alarming and you can see what's happening. If you look inside here, I actually had two contracts that I was carrying over. I have a short term 950 short put, right? For 13 cents. They're giving me a price of zero. So they basically just took that premium out and I get that 13 cents because it's a short contract. But the bigger problem is I have a long contract that's a much larger size. It's supposed to be trading at 560, but again, they're showing me zero. So did I lose $5.60? Did they steal all my money? Well, no, of course they didn't. That's the punchline, but I can understand why people thought that they would have. You woke up that morning quite alarmed that your account value is if you had long options, significantly lower. If you had short options, could have been significantly higher. But let's look at, actually before we show this, let's just look at, this is the short contract that I have. This is the 30th of April, it expires this Friday. I had this 950. You can see that red POS for position. Everything's just showing NA0. If we do the same thing for the long contract that I have, this expires in 147 days. I have that 14 strike. Again, NA0 across the board. This is very alarming. They seemingly took my money. Here's one minute after the market's open. So this is 631, 931 New York time. Now you can see my account value is 214,813. This is nice, but it's far too much money. It should probably only be 200,000 according to the night before. And I actually have some positions that were up money. So it should probably say 201,000. But now it says 214. If we look closely, well, what has happened for the 950 put, they're actually priced, it was 13 the night before, now they're pricing it at 32 cents. This is way, way off. The market was up a little bit, but it was essentially what we could consider flat. And then my long contract, it was 560 the night before, and they're pricing it at 677 now. Very advantageous for me as a long put holder. And now I'm, I have way more money than I should have. So I guess I could celebrate there. Let's keep going. This is 6.53, 23 minutes after the markets have been open, things are starting to settle down. You can see the account value is back down reasonably close to where it should be. It's still slightly high, it's about a thousand too high, but I have advantageous positions, so it's not that far off. It should be about 202. And you can see here, these are getting closer. It was 5.60 the night before, they're showing me six. It should probably be 565, but it is actually getting closer just 23 minutes after the market's open. And again, we can see the market makers, while there are very wide bid ask spreads at this time, 23 minutes later, it's getting close. This is the one that I hold, five to 13. I would like to see it, you know, two cents, that would be normal, but five to 13 is, is getting there. So they can start giving me something reasonable. And then the long strike, four to eight, this is very wide, but you can see that 20 minutes in, they're actually doing a reasonable job catching up here. Let's go to an hour and 15 minutes later. All right, this is the last one. An hour and 15 minutes after the market's opened, on that day of the reverse split, everything is totally normal. The account is 202, which it should be, because I'm up about 2,000 on those positions. And you can see here, my short option, 13 cents, the markets are up a little, meaning VXX is down a little. It should be about 11 or 12 cents, and it's showing 11.50. This one, the markets are up, up a little, VXX is down a little. That means that I should probably make a nickel, and I did. It's showing 5.65. So it actually only took one hour. I understand that pre-market people were freaking out, but it actually only took one hour to get the bid-ask spreads fairly normal again. 10 to 13 on a, a strike there, that's fine. It should probably be two cents, but three cents is well within normal. And here's my long strike for 147 days out. There's the 14. 550 to 580, mid price 565, totally normal. At this point, one hour and 14 minutes after the market's open, it's basically as if the split never happened. Now it does take a little bit of time for them to settle through this, which I will get to a couple of tips in a second, but you can see for 
anything pre-market would have scared people, especially if this is your first ride holding positions through a reverse split. I can totally understand. Um, but you can see it only took them an hour. So a few tips that I can give you. This is the last thing and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. You can ask about this stuff, the UVXY debacle, or just any volatility questions. But uh, tip number one, if you have options that are sensitive, if you have option positions where you anticipate that you might actually need to close them the next day or within two days, then it's probably a good idea to just close them ahead of time. So the reverse split happened Thursday night. Official date was market close indicative value on Thursday. Friday morning, if you anticipated that you had a short dated contract that might have needed management Friday, you probably shouldn't have carried it through Thursday night anyway. So that's tip number one. Any option positions that you think you might need to do something with in the first day, just close them ahead of time. Don't even deal with the bid ask spreads and the changing of the values. No value changes hands, you don't lose your money, but you might lose the ability to adjust your positions, especially in the morning. That brings us to tip number two. Don't rush in in the first hour or two and try to force any trades. Just sit on your hands, they will work it all out. I know the bid ask spread looks scary and you think, well, what's going on? I just, I, I lost my money or I effectively lost my money because you can't get the bid ask or you're, you're worried you can't get the midpoint. Don't force your trades. They'll work it all out behind the scenes. These, these are market makers, it's all official. Nobody's trying to screw us, nobody's manipulating. It just takes some time. These are, there's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes. So I would recommend if you can do it, no trades for the first two or three hours on a reverse split day. That would be probably best practices. And uh, you should be fine. After that, certainly by noon, afternoon, you can start taking trades again as normal. You saw in my software, Thinkorswim, I, my long-term portfolios at Interactive Brokers, same thing. Um, first hour was a nightmare. And then probably by noon, everything looked fine to me. And I always take trades end of day anyway. So it was completely normal end of day. And the third tip that I have is for option trading, especially with the VTS community, um, we only trade the highest liquid options. So we never really worry about this too much. We just go for that mid price. For example, basic math, if something's trading at a dollar and a dollar 20, that's the bid ask spread just for simple math. If you're long an option and you want to close it out, you want the highest price possible. So typically we would start at 115 and then wait 20 seconds. If you don't get it, drop it down to 110, try to get that midpoint. If you're short an option and you want to buy it back, of course you want to buy it back for cheaper, start at 105, wait 20, 30 seconds, bump it up to 110 and you'll get the mid price because we do trade only the most liquid stuff. On reverse split days, just for that day or maybe the next couple of days, just because software sometimes have a difficult time keeping up, and as you saw, the bid ask spreads can look fairly alarming, I want you to be really careful and really cautious. So in my example, a dollar, dollar twenty bid ask spread, if you're long an option and you're trying to sell it, don't start at 115. Your software might not be showing the actual correct bid asks. So just for this day, it's a little bit annoying, start at 140, start at 135. Like really try to Get, get a price that you know you're probably not gonna get and then wait 20, 30 seconds, drop it to 130, wait 30 seconds, drop it to 125. Keep going down, starting at a place where you know it's well out of the range and then keep dropping it down. You don't have to nickel and dime option trades if you're trading liquid stuff. These are computers, they're very quick. You don't have to sit in front of your computer for an hour trying to get that best price. But on reverse split days, just in case your broker is having troubles on the front end of the platform showing you the correct prices, be totally conservative. If you're short an option and you're trying to buy it back, don't start at 105, start at 75. Just something ridiculous, a price that you haven't seen in, in over a week. 75, 80, 85, 90. It might take you five minutes, might take you 10 minutes, but just best practices, just prepare for the fact that your brokers are showing you potentially um, very, very wide spreads. And that's it. So. Just to recap, the UVXY, apparently it's reverse splitting. I, I think it is. I really do think it is. Um, absolutely terrible announcement. I don't know how that passed any of their compliance or anything, but okay, it is what it is. Um, let's 
let's say that it's happening next week, next Thursday. Same thing. Price will go up 10 times, shares will be divided by 10 times, nothing happens. You can hold it if you want. Of course, this is a total side note, unimportant to the reverse split, but I don't recommend people hold long volatility ETPs for more than a day or two, unless it is very well calculated hedging. If you're a very sophisticated investor and you can calibrate that hedge, maybe you can hold it for long term. But I'm not saying you should just hold your UVXY through, Hopefully you're not holding it at all, but if you are, you won't lose any value. You'll just see 10 times the price, you'll have 10 times fewer shares, and that's all that's happening. In the options again, you'll see the next day, it'll say very, very similar to the VXX. This UVXY, UVXY will just say 10 to 100 for the first day, and then the monthlies will start getting filled in probably the next day. Because remember, market makers have to make money as well. So they are no longer incentivized to be managing the old string, they're just gonna give you an effective way to get out of the trades. They're not gonna remove anything, they're not gonna take anything, but they're gonna be focusing on the new strings, of course. So you're gonna, probably within a day or so, you're gonna see the monthlies pop up. And I'm a little surprised we're not seeing weeklies yet in the VXX, but let's just be patient. I suppose I would predict that that might be happening soon. Um, and that's it. And then of course, best practices. Nothing wrong with just closing it out the day before and looking to reestablish a materially similar position in, in the next string. Like I said, it'll take a day. You don't have to wait very long. Two days for sure, the liquidity should come up. Um, I can show you that as well. This was the day of, or this was Monday on the VXX. So one day after the reverse split. You can see the hundreds are already popping up. They will of course have zero volume. So you can see that here. There's no volume on the new ones yet because this is seven minutes after the market opened. But on that same day, already just one day in, you can see the volume starting to come in. You know, a thousand at the, at the money there, 2,700 at the money here. It doesn't take very long. VXX is a very, very liquid market. UVXY less so, but it's enough. So um, be patient. And um, like I said, tip number three there, just for that one day or just for two or three days, try to get prices that are well outside the realm of possible to get exercised. There's nothing wrong with taking an extra five minutes to get those trades. That's what I did, I closed, eventually I did close both of those trades that you saw, um, both of them for profit, not that that matters, but I was very careful in closing them out. I wanted to make sure that I get the price that I deserve. These are computers and they all get cleared at kind of the same place, so it doesn't matter what broker you use, you shouldn't really get screwed on the execution. That is your money, and you should get something close to the actual mid. It's just, what is it displaying? The displayed mid might actually be wrong. So just be super conservative for that one day, and you should be fine. Overall, splits do nothing. So uh, it's just a number, and of course we know volatility ETPs, that number's irrelevant. Doesn't matter what it is, we are only looking at Again, I encourage you to go watch that other video explaining all of this, but this is all we care about. They track an underlying methodology, and no matter what price they are flagging, if the VXX is 10 or 50, if the UVXY is 100 or 500 or three, doesn't matter. It tracks these underlying indexes, and the methodology of tracking the front two months of the VIX futures as they converge down to the spot VIX at expiration. That's all you need to know. The actual price, we don't care. So hopefully that'll prepare some of you for the next time this happens. There's been six VXX reverse splits. It launched on uh, January 29th, 2009. So in, what is that, 12 years, there's been six, once every two years on average. UVXY launched October 3rd, 2011. So that's 10 years, and this is the 10th one. So probably you can expect if you're an active volatility trader, hopefully all of you in my comment section are, you can probably expect to have to deal with something like this once a year, give or take. Um, we hope it's more because most of us are short ball traders, so we hope it's more. But yeah, once a year you'll have to deal with it. For a day or two, it's gonna look weird. But um, if you're prepared with those quick tips on how to do it, you're not gonna get bad fail prices. So. Uh, that's it, it's really a lot simpler than people think. It's just, um, I, I'm sorry to everybody who woke up that morning and just had a really rotten morning thinking they had lost 
however much money it said that they lost. That's that's scary. I would imagine butterflies and terrified. You, you can contact your broker, but yeah. Follow me on Twitter. DM me if you need to. Um, I'll settle your mind. So I'll encourage you that nothing too diabolical happened. It's just uh, it's just a short term thing. So that's it. Um, let's open it up to questions. And there is quite a few people watching right now. If you wouldn't mind, give the video a like. Um, you know, when you're when you're on my live streams, I don't want your money. Don't super chat or anything like that. Keep your money, but just give me a like. Uh, it really helps the algorithm. So uh, let's open it up to questions. I'm just gonna go right from the top as usual. I'll get to as many as I can. Um, every stream, there's way more questions than I can get to. We'll probably cut this at about an hour. So let's get going right away. So the very first question, what trigger will return us back to one times leverage factor in SVXY? So the reason this question is being asked is because on February 27th, 2018, after the Volpocalypse, a couple weeks later, the instead of, you know, remember the XIV just flat out terminated, it's gone. Um, our old friend, pour out a little liquor for the XIV. The SVXY, which is a materially identical ETF to the XIV, they didn't terminate but they did deleverage from one times to 0 0.5 times. So that's how they've handled it. And since then, for the last three years, it's a 0.5 times leverage factor. So just to keep everybody up to speed there. Um, what would make it go back to one times leverage? Well, I suspect because the, the rebalancing methodology is a little bit flawed, or at the very least, it's inadequate these days. When these products launched you know, in, in 2011, October 3rd, 2011, for the SVXY, they probably didn't anticipate that the vol ETP space would get that large, to get so large that it actually starts to put a lot of pressure on the VIX futures market. So all of these ETFs have to rebalance in the same little tiny window of aftermarket rebalancing. Um, so certainly, I mean, if it's not negligence, it's certainly just, it's not suitable these days. Now there is a new product coming. We are hoping that it's coming. It's been filed for, it's been approved. I've done videos on it. SVIX, it is a replacement for the XIV. And I would imagine the aftermarket rebalancing is what they focused on. It's probably much better. So the only thing that could get the SVXY to get approval back to go to one times leverage would be if they also addressed the limitations of the very short rebalancing window. And I'm not much of a compliance guy. I've never you know, worked in the financial industry. I've never built an ETF. I don't actually know how easy it is for them to switch their methodology like that. So if they're able to switch it, then perhaps we would see that. If they're not, if it's just sort of written in stone and you'd have to actually relaunch a product to change it, then I suspect not. But um, if you asked me for my personal opinion, I would say I'd like SVXY to stay 0 0.5. And then I'd also like the SVIX to come in we don't know when that's gonna happen. It's been approved, it could be tomorrow, could be next year, could be never. But um, if that approves at one times, I'd like to still have a 0 0.5 times, that'd be great. So that would be the only way. They can't bring it back to one times leverage in its current form. That would be highly unethical because uh, the volatility market is just too large for the VIX futures volume to handle and we could very easily wind up with another volpocalypse. So I suspect never. Is, is my answer, but I don't know. I'm not a compliance guy. If they can just you know switch their methodology and say, well, we're gonna expand the rebalancing window so we can start before the market closes, hey, maybe maybe that'll, that'll happen. I don't know. But I would like to see it stay at 0 0.5. I think, it's, uh, I think it's good to have some variety. Yep, got the golf bag in the back. Titleist bag, but um, so I, I've got Mizuno irons, um, got the MP20s, and I've, I'm a tailor-made guy with the woods. So, um, although I am trying the new uh, Maverick from Callaway, so uh, don't actually have any Titleist clubs. I just the bag's the best. Best golf course in Vancouver, um, in my opinion, Capilano. Um, Shaughnessy is probably the best course in Vancouver. Just pure, hard challenging tournament style course. I've played tournaments at, at Shaughnessy 
Um, that's where they host all the big major events. Anytime there's an actual PGA event or an LPGA event, probably Shaughnessy is the most appropriate. Capilano's gorgeous, and um, I'm on the waiting list for Capilano, <laughs> but it's eight years. So um, in 2029, hopefully I am uh, finally a member at Capilano. So, uh, but that would be my number one. But then of course, nearby, I mean, we've got Whistler. It's, it's so beautiful out there. Um, it's not a real championship style course, but it's just, you can't beat the views. Um, Furry Creek, we've got, we've got a lot of very, very beautiful courses in Vancouver. Uh, Pacific Northwest, I mean, going down through the US, Oregon, Washington, probably my favorite place for golf in the whole world. Um, Pebble's my favorite course, but I think Pacific Northwest has more, um, more variety of awesome courses. Yes, we suspect next, um, I'm gonna guess Thursday. Just like I said, announcement comes April 22nd. Let's give them two weeks to get it done. April, May 6th is the two week cutoff, but don't hold me to that. It, it was a nightmare. Um, watch the beginning of the stream, yeah. Yes, yep, like I said, you probably asked that before I talked, so I think I answered that one. But yeah, I'm expecting the weeklies to come in. I trade the weeklies, so certainly for VXX, I trade the weeklies a lot. Um, I'm hoping that they, they come in pretty soon. Um, within the next few days would be great because uh, we're taking the week off right now. We've got the vol trend strategy at VTS that we're in cash right now. And my vol trend overlay, it's for anybody, few of you who are in the VTS community, it'll start as soon as we have weeklies as well, but there's no weeklies to trade right now. So hopefully they get those soon. QLD is a higher maximum drawdown than the ARC per what you showed in your last stream. That is true. Um, I believe the QLD has had a drawdown since the ARC launched of around 52, something like that. ARC has a drawdown of around 44. But what I didn't show in that video, my last stream, by the way, was about the ARC Innovation ETF. Um, what I didn't show was if you were to map out all 10 of the largest drawdowns, and then start to calculate an ulcer performance index, I think you would see that the, uh, the NASDAQ's more consistent. So um, that was more to the point of that video that the arc is just too unpredictable. Um, it goes down when the markets are going up and I personally can't have that. When I'm in equities, I need to know that it's gonna follow equities and it's a discretionary fund and we, we have no control over what they hold and how those holdings perform. So even though the maximum drawdown is technically higher, I suspect the ARC is substantially more volatile um, statistically. Currently bag holding 1,500 shares of UVXY with a cost basis of seven. Ouch. Sorry to hear that. Hoping that I can sell those shares at a loss once it spikes above five. Now, I'm not a registered advisor. I can't give you any personalized investment advice. I can only personalize it to myself. And hopefully in that answer, you can read between the lines a little bit. But what I would be telling myself is, first of all, statistically speaking, why would I hold a long volatility ETP when I know that over 80% of the time I'm going to be wrong? That just doesn't sound like a very good bet to me. Also, if you are the type of person that thinks you can time volatility spikes, I'm not being rude here, I'm just stating the fact and it applies for me as well and everybody in the comment section, you're wrong. I don't know what led you to believe, probably confirmation bias, recency bias. You probably believe that, wow, I timed the last one so well, I can consistently do this. You can't, but I can't either. I'm not making fun of you. I can't, no one in the comment section can. So if you are going to be playing the contrarian, you're gonna to try to time these spikes. Why would you do it with something that is pretty close to a five times leveraged S&P 500 position? Right now, the markets are at all time highs. Would you short the market? It's only a one times leverage. Would you short? Probably not, the markets are going up. Why would anybody short and just guess that they're gonna crash? But would you do it at five times leverage factor? If there was a five times S&P 500 ETF, there aren't, there's only three. You can go to the UPRO, which is a three times, or the SPXL, which is a three times. There are no five times, but if there was, 
would you short that? No. It's just for some reason mentally people think it's okay to short it because it's a volatility ETF. It's not. It's a massively leveraged contrarian position that will very likely not work for you. So that's the first thing I'd say to myself. Again, hint, hint. Um, not giving you advice here. Second thing I would say is, is there really a difference between the price at 450 right now and spiking to five? I mean, the mistake has already been made. Would that really salvage much? I mean, because it's far more likely to go to $4 than it is to $5. And so after the split, it will be, say, for the sake of argument, 45. You're waiting for it to get to 50. It's far more likely to go into the 30s before it hits 50 again. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't hit 50. It could hit 100, could hit 200. And you'll sell it and think, wow, that was the worst decision ever. But I would judge process, not results. And uh, holding something that goes down 80% of the time at a four and a half leverage factor, it's not gonna work out well for you. Long-term, I have no idea how this trade is gonna work out, but long-term, that's not a consistent winning strategy. So uh, I would uh, well, check out that video I said about how the VIX futures actually work, how the ETFs track the futures and, and why they decay so fast and so consistently. Um, you might learn something there. And you just come to the realization that it's just not a trade worth taking. Um, if I do miss a few of those VIX spikes, so be it. I, I would rather miss a few of the spikes than nearly always bleed capital. And that's what ends up happening. So long volatility ETPs are insurance products. They are meant to be hedging vehicles only. They're not meant to be held long term. It explicitly states that in the pr prospectus. If you need to see it, read the prospectus. It literally spells it out. These are not meant to be held. Um, but just learn what learn how they function and you'll come to that realization on your own. It's a, it's a bad risk reward profile. So uh, I closed all VXX options a few hours before market close. Yeah, good call. Um, honestly, the only reason I didn't, um, the short put option that I had open was part of my overlay strategy and it's a short put option. So I don't need any management whatsoever the next few days. There's nothing that could happen in the market that would make me need to get in there and, and manage that trade. So it's fine to let that one go. Uh, the other one, same thing. I have a short light or a green light for short vol right now. And um, we've been short vol for what, probably two months now. Um, quite enjoying the, the drop in volatility. But um, it's a long-term contract, which doesn't need any maintenance until we actually have to close it. So nothing imminent for me. But again, like I said, best practices, if you have something that you anticipate the next day, you might very well have to manage that, then do like Winston did here, close it out the day before. You're only gonna lose one day, it doesn't really matter. Can you open new positions on old VXX options? IB disallows. I've never tried. I don't see any reason why anybody would ever want to do that. Remember, the market makers from their perspective, they have to make money, right? So it's their job to get people trading. They're not making money sort of gaming the system. They're making money trying to get create a market so that people trade it they're just incentivized to focus much more on the new contracts. So I'm, I'm not saying the old contracts break after a reverse split, they don't. And you can actually, you know, if you wanna play in that market and keep your options open, I'll, uh, I'll try to trade one of these. I just, there'd be zero reason to ever do that. So if they disallow it, I wouldn't know. I've never tried and never would. That would be, uh, that'd be not smart. It's kind of like the old TVIX, right? Remember TVIX was delisted. You could still trade it after the fact, but the way volatility ETPs work, you actually do have to have that share creation functioning very, very actively. They have to be actively managed. So as soon as they delist the product, just because you can still technically trade it, doesn't mean you should. It, once the share creation is gone, the incentive to manage that product is gone, and you are just throwing money at something that is, is a total crapshoot. You have no idea how it's gonna function. It's kind of the same in these options. You're looking at market makers who no longer have incentive to manage them correctly. You don't know if the bid ask spread is just gonna get extremely wide or whether you can even get the mid price. I would, um, like I said, just, you don't need to panic sell. You don't need to 
you know, just dump everything. We, we can be strategic with it, but you have to know that it is in your best interest to move to the ones that are still being targeted and prioritized by the market makers. This one's in a different language. So hopefully you got the answer there. I got that one. Okay, Wasabi. Opinion on shorting a put on SPY with minus 0.5 delta instead of buying a call on SPY with 0.5 delta. Well, they're entirely different trades. I'm curious about your elaboration. Well, so the thing is when you're buying a call option on the SPY, this is more of a stock replacement style trade where you are going to be tracking pretty well. But when you're shorting options, best case scenario, you can only get the premium that you short. So if you short a put, the upside potential profit is very limited. The downside is pretty far down. I mean, of course it can go down. Buying a call is a totally different trade than selling a put. I think what you're probably trying to ask is shorting a put spread versus buying a call spread, maybe something like that. But if you're just asking a short put versus a long call, um, these are just, just put them in a different basket. They're, they're just they're not related to each other. I hate it when optional product goes below 10. Um, it, I mean, what it, what it can do, of course, like I said, we don't really care about what the actual dollar value of the products are, but well, I mean, one side benefit to, I, th I think what you're alluding to here, of course, number of contracts, right? Trading itself has gotten very cheap, if not free at most brokers, but you will still be paying for option contracts. They've not reduced that very much. So let's just say you're paying 0.5 per option. If something is at five bucks, you're gonna be opening quite a few contracts. Whereas if something is trading at 50, you're gonna get away with far less contracts. So if you're an active trader in the vol space, you probably do want to see these products with higher dollar values. The flip side to that is, if you're doing stock replacement, you probably want it to be lower because let's say something is trading at $100. The difference between one contract and two contracts is quite significant. Whereas if something's trading at $10, the difference between one and two is far less. So you can open 26 contracts instead of 27. But when something's a very high dollar value and you do stock replacement, you might be choosing between opening one or two contracts or maybe two to three. That's still a pretty big gap. So it always depends which side of the trade you're on. Sometimes a high dollar value is beneficial and sometimes a low dollar value is beneficial. I like to trade both sides. I'm My option trading is probably, I'd say if I had to guess, 60% uh, on net short and 40% net long but I do trade a significant amount on both sides. So I don't actually care what the prices do. <clears throat> Is IB showing the end of month, April 30th expiration for the new VXX? I haven't checked my IB. Um, no, I've only checked my thinkorswim here. And no, no, they have not. So I'll check IB, that'd be interesting. Um, I, I would suspect no, because once it's available, it's available on all the platforms. I would be shocked if Thinkorswim um, made a mistake like that. Another weekly option question, not available, likely Thursday market open. I, I don't know why we would think Thursday, but I agree that within the next day or two, market makers are gonna wanna continue their job and continue making money. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, of course, weekly options are created. Yeah, maybe that could be it. Um, doesn't really explain. I mean, they could start filling in everything uh, right away and hopefully by Wednesday. So vol trend, if, if that is on Thursday, I don't typically take one to two day trades, but I'll probably almost immediately, assuming markets are the same now than, and they are Wednesday, Thursday, I'll probably take a trade for next Friday's expiry and everything will resume as normal. Vol trend, vol trend overlay. We will start trading again. And as soon as those appear, and as soon as there's, I mean, I'm not gonna do it the morning of, um, maybe another one of those best practices thing. Might wanna wait a day or two, but um, 
if you're just trading a few contracts, I'm sure it's fine. If I try to get a community of people, you know, the morning of, it, it might cause a few issues. Okay, why during the last three spikes on VIX, the UVXY has not spiked the same magnitude, but did decay? Do you mean literally the, the um, percentage change? Because the UVXY and the VIX have nothing to do with each other. I know that they're highly correlated, they're volatility instruments, but the VIX index tracks the S&P 500 options market and the UVXY tracks the VIX futures, the front two months of the VIX futures. These have nothing to do with each other. So the day-to-day -day differences between the VIX and the UVXY can be vast. Long-term, when you stretch it out, the correlation is quite high. Day-to-day, -day, one could go up and the other goes down. I mean, they could go in the exact opposite direction. Um, it's, they're not related to each other. So the UVXY tracks at a 1.5 times leverage factor, the daily movement of the underlying SPVIX STR index. That's what it is, day to day, right? Daily rebalanced. It's tracking this index at a 1.5 times leverage factor. This index is tracking a methodology of holding a 30 day constant maturity VIX futures contract and how those contracts, the value changes as we approach expiration in the VIX futures. So we have 21 days to go, 21 days from now, this dot will be right on this green line. Whether it's high, low, we don't know. We'll see how it moves around. VIX futures are free to do whatever they want. It's a freely traded market. But on expiration, these will be the same thing, and then the, the cycle will reset. So we can get good assumptions on where this thing is gonna go, but the VIX index is entirely different. The VIX index is based on a you know, a basket of those options in the S&P 500 options market, which literally day to day can, can move in opposite directions. So I hope that's what you were asking, if that answers it. If not, ask it again. Maybe I'll get, uh, I'll do better the second time around. But yeah, volatility ETPs have, have absolutely nothing to do with the VIX index. Very common mistake. People think, well, what's going on? The VIX is up 3%, but the UVXY is flat or, you know, maybe it's it's up 10% or maybe it's down. That's why, it's because they're not the same. It's literally two different products. Um, options, option classes are created by exchange, not by brokers, so all brokers are the same. Yeah, well, that's the point. Like ProShares and, you know, Credit Suisse and all these companies, they are managing their ETFs, but they're not the ones managing the options at all. They have nothing to do with it. So when you look at an announcement, like a, corporate announcement like this from ProShares, you'll notice they kind of explain everything that's gonna happen. They, they even go through examples, pre-split, post-split. You can see, like I talked about, all they're going to do on a reverse split is increase the price, reduce the shares. On a normal split, they're going to reduce the price, increase the shares. But you'll notice that nowhere on here they're ex explaining what the options are gonna do. And the reason for that is they don't manage the options. So it's not their job, it's out of their wheelhouse. Interactive brokers, they'll just pick up on them when they're available and so will Thinkorswim. Hopefully so will Robinhood. I don't know, I've never used it. People complain about it. Hopefully they're smart enough to pick up on it and they'll all show them on the same day. Let's hope. Hopefully there's no major mistakes in that regard because there's no reason why they shouldn't all show on the same day. Um, the options are managed by market makers and all those contracts kind of get routed to the same similar places. So um, it's totally independent of what the actual ETFs are doing. It's interesting. I can't really go into this too much. Basic VXX option trade that you would make. So I don't know, I'll, I'll rifle off several for you here. So if I have a signal to short volatility, I'm not gonna go into what would give me a signal to do that. Let's just assume I have decided for whatever reason, I have a green light to short volatility. Um, one option that I do sometimes is I will buy long dated VXX put options. So the one that I, I had last week had 150 days to expiration. The reason we keep them that far out is because the only negative aspect to trading long-term put options is theta decay. So we wanna keep that at bay. It doesn't really start decaying very quickly until about you know 50 days or so. So I just like to keep them about 100 days out, and that's a short fall position. 
Uh, another thing I do quite often is I sell VXX put options, just collect a little bit of premium and um, hopefully the rest of my portfolio balances that out. Um, I have another option strategy that I call the vol, uh, the vol step. I'll show you that real quick. That's why those dots are on my uh, thinkorswim. This is a um, vol step strategy where I'm essentially, if I have a green light to, to short vol, which again, I'm not going to get into, it, it's very detailed. You don't just want to just on a whim think, I suspect it's going to go down. You want to be very quant based and and very systematic on when you enter and exit trades. But if I get the short ball signal, sometimes I will buy long UVXY put off, put verticals where you're buying a put and then you're selling an out of the money put against it. Or I will sell short call verticals. Those are actually materially identical trades, mathematically identical. I know a lot of people think, well, one of them's short ball, one of them's long ball. That's totally not true. Long put verticals and short call verticals are structurally identical. Um, if you want to reference a video here, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've pretty much got a video covering everything, but um, where is it here? Um, I've got one that is probably labeled something like that. Um, where is it? Let me just type in vertical. I don't want to waste too much time here. Mm, a lot of option trades there. Oh no. Anyway, it's something called <laughs> something called short call verticals and long put verticals are identical. Sorry, I can't get the actual thing on the fly here. I'm still uh, a little bit nervous on the live streams, but those are some examples of trades that I would take. Um, typically those three, stock replacement through long-term VXX put options, short-term VXX put options, typically weekly cycles, and then vertical spreads. Oftentimes I have another strategy that I call directional flies, which sometimes I will actually do butterflies, broken wing butterflies. I have a video on broken wing butterflies where you can get somewhat directional, but still keep that, you know, positive theta factor intact. So um, check out those four. I've got videos for all four of them on the YouTube channel. Where am I? Let's catch up with the chat here. Not a big fan of IB. I kind of like IB. I mean, my long-term portfolios has been at IB since 2011. Um, I In 2006, I started with Thinkorswim, or it was Thinkorswim, just TD Ameritrade. And then 2011, I switched over and haven't really looked back. I, I really like IB, but Thinkorswim's very good as well. I would recommend, well, not recommend, but in my opinion, those are the best two. So uh, can't go wrong with either. IB is the ugliest software in the world. That's why I don't use it for any of my videos. It's just the worst thing you'll ever see. Thinkorswim is really nice to look at. So um, that's why I use my live stream account. Our test account is Thinkorswim. It's a awesome looking platform and intuitive and easy to use. So, okay, how long do I have? <laughs> what was your career before getting into the vol space? There's my career before the vol space. I was a professional golfer for many years. Um, I, I, I very successful amateur golf career. I started when I was 15. By the time I was, you know, 22, 23, I turned pro. Played pro golf till I was 30. That was 2005. Um, for reference, I'm 45 years old. So I retired from golf at 30, and then I started investing. So uh, I've been doing this for 16 years now. Investing career, sort of my second career. But for 20 years of my life. I was uh, entirely focused on golf. Um, I did go to university for you know economics and math. I have a major minor in economics and math, but yeah, I was golfing. And I don't golf much anymore. I've got the clubs back there. They kind of look cool, but trust me, they're pretty clean. They, they don't get much use. Uh, I, I probably golf, I've probably played 10 rounds. No, no joke, 10 rounds in the last seven or eight years twice a year if I'm lucky. So I, I keep saying I'm gonna get back into it. I'm 45, you know, I'm, I'm in good shape. I always keep myself in good shape. I exercise, I eat right. So I'm turning senior in five years. I always kind of think in the back of my head, you know, what if I you know, dusted off the old golf clubs and tried to, uh, tried to make the senior tour at 50? Cause I'm certainly in much better shape than most 50 year olds. So, uh, 
you know, maybe there's a chance. I might, might dust off, off those sticks and give it another shot. But uh, yeah, I haven't golfed in 15 years. Totally switched careers, but I actually view them as the same career. I, I keep intending to do a video on that. Just the, the similarities between if you want to call it a sport or not, or me a professional athlete or not, I am not offended if you don't. But the similarities between being a pro athlete and being an investor, it, it's actually there's a surprising amount of overlap. So it, it probably sounds jarring, but same skill set. Um, investors, former professional athletes do tend to be pretty good investors, pretty good entrepreneurs, because the skill sets are the same. You know, just discipline, sacrifice, hard work, self motivation. All of these things transfer over to anything that you'll do in life. So sounds like, wow, golf and investing, it's just polar opposites. It's really not. It's, I, I felt very well prepared for an investing career after golf. Okay, what time is it? I always go over the hour. Notice the new SVIX product isn't gonna come out until the new all-time highs instead of bear market low. Um, so, I mean, remember the, the price of the product is irrelevant. So if you mean that you want to get into it and just kind of hold it by and hold, yeah, I could see a point where you would maybe rather, rather do that. I mean, if they were just custom designing something and they wanted to produce the best possible track record as soon as possible, you'd probably want to jump into the market at a low, right? When the markets are crashing, launch the product then. And then when the markets bounce in this buy the dip Fed induced market, they will bounce probably strong. Um, that would look very good for the SVIX. You'd get that, you know, massive initial vol crush. It would look awesome. But I, I don't think there's any, you know, there, there's no puppet master behind the scenes. I'm sure they're just going to launch it when it launches. And uh, it is what it is. Because the, the price is irrelevant to us. We still have to manage our entries and exits. And remember, we can make just as much money on the long vol side as we can on the short vol side. So I personally don't care. I just want this thing to launch. I have no interest at all in the TVIX revival. Remember, there's actually two. The SVIX, which is a one times inverse. And then the UVIX. I think those are the names of them. Um, which is supposed to be a two times long, just a, a new TVIX. No interest whatsoever in that one. It, it could, you know, could die forever and I would not care, but I do want to see the SVIX. How much more can I do? Like I said, there's way more questions than I will ever get to. So follow me on Twitter. We do streams all the time. If you missed it today, just get me next time. Like I, I'm just going through the list, literally ask me anything. I, I don't skip anything. I don't, you know, I give you an answer no matter what. So um, come back next time for sure. I'll think up a new topic here and uh, we'll maybe try for one, maybe Saturday, maybe next Monday or something, but um, follow me on Twitter for sure. Sorry, I missed the beginning. Have you ever considered an alternative strategy for short vol using stocks instead of ETFs? Well, it doesn't work the same way because um, one, of the, one of the awesome benefits to actually directly trading volatility ETPs is the ability for us to be systematic in our entries and exits based on the methodology. We are essentially exploiting our knowledge. Whenever you're trading, you need an edge. Our edge in the volatility space comes from understanding how the product works and knowing that even if stocks stay flat, volatility ETPs can still make money. If you are trying to do a stock strategy using volatility signals, it does not work. I've actually done a video on that. Um, what did I call it? I've certainly done an article on that. Essentially what I was showing is if you just try to stuff in a long equity position every time my signals say to short vol, like our short vol strategies have made a ton of profit in the last eight years. If I just stuff an equities position in place of them, the whole thing falls apart. It, it doesn't work at all. It, it barely outperforms the index. And um, the reason for that is that it's not, it's no longer capitalizing on the, the, the basically the one, two punch of a, when markets go up, volatility drops, and that's good for short vol. But B, 
Remember, markets can correct in two ways. They can correct with price, it can crash, or they can correct with time. It can just chop around sideways. If you get chop around sideways for a month, that equity position's not making any money. But the short vol guy can still make money doing that. We don't care about chop, that's still fine. As long as the markets are flat, we're still gonna have positive roll yield in the VIX futures curve. And there's no reason why we can't pick up more profit. But the whole thing kind of breaks down when you turn it into a binary up down. And so no, I don't do that. I have plenty of equity strategies, um, tactical balance, defensive rotation, VB threshold, all three of those strategies do use equity positions, but equity for equity, short vol for short vol, let's um, compartmentalize things and, and really exploit the edge. That's, that's what I do anyway. I haven't found any success trying to substitute equities for short vol. Short vol is a, a sort of a, an asset class of its own and it should be treated that way. <clears throat> Some crosstalk here, sometimes that confuses me in the live streams. I'm, I might look like a deer in the headlights, but there's people having a conversation with each other, so it's kind of hard. All right, this will be the last question. And then, like I said, just come back next time um, and I'll answer everything again. Ask them earlier on and then you'll, you'll get your question answered. Okay, what are your thoughts holding bull put spread pre-reverse split expiring 2023? Entered last week and planning on holding till next week? Wait, I, I'm missing something here. Your thoughts holding a bull put spread on a vol ETP on VXX Pre-reverse split, expiring January 20th, 2023, entered last week and planning on holding till next week. So you're trading a, a two plus year contract as a weekly hold? I'm missing something here. That doesn't make any sense. Probably I'm misinterpreting. Sometimes on a live stream, it's one of those things where you're, I feel nervous and I read the question and Believe me, I speak English, so I I should understand what you're saying, but sometimes you just stare at it and you just, for the life of you, can't just figure it out. And then I'll watch the rebroadcast and I'll think, oh, of course, that's what he was asking. So maybe that's one of these situations. I don't know why. If I'm reading this right, and let's assume I'm not, let's assume this is my mistake, why would you trade a 2023 contract with the intent of closing it next week? It, it just does not decay like that. The the risk reward curve is not in your favor at all if that's what you're planning on doing. I When I'm planning on a short-term hold, I trade the weeklies. Or, I mean, sometimes when I'm trading things like iron condors, because you can lose a lot more than you can make, net short iron condor, typically I trade about 85% probability of success. So you can lose a lot more than you can make. In that respect, I trade longer dated contract, excuse me, longer dated contracts, and I will have a stop gain, stop loss at say 50% of the premium collected. And sometimes you get it in a week. Sometimes the premium comes in in a week and there it is. I, I held it for a week, but it was an 80 day contract. Verticals are, you know, verticals aren't really like that. They don't sort of, I think verticals are best traded on a monthly cycle, personally. So I'm going to punt on this question. I'm going to assume that there's something about that 2023 date that's sort of bothering my brain here. I'm going to do one more question because I feel like I completely whiffed on that one. Okay, this is the last one though. Sorry, I got to let everybody go. People don't like streams when they're longer than about an hour. I can see on the back end YouTube analytics, things just kind of drop off. So I got to let you go and everybody just come back next time. All right, not related to the rebalance. Do you think possible to replicate MDY by buying SPY options with 45 days to expiration and Delta 0.5 continues? So you're talking about stock replacement. If so, would it need to be rebalanced to keep it parallel? And if so, how often? I ask with your tactical balance strategy in mind and that MDY options seem to be very illiquid. Okay, so this is a stock replacement question. Yes, of course, you can always do stock replacement. 
the general way it works, just so I can include everybody else in this question as well. When you're doing stock replacement, you are buying, in this case, you would be buying long call options, long dated long call options in the SPY instead of the MDY. The MDY is the S&P 400 mid cap, the SPY is the S&P 500, the SPY is far more liquid. They're roughly the same price, they're in the several hundred range, so um, you should probably replace your MDY stock replacement with the SPY or the Qs. They're probably liquid enough. Um, 45 days out, I like to keep them 100 days out, 100 to 130. We are doing stock replacement. So we are trying to simulate the movement of the underline while using options instead of the underline. So what I typically do is 100 plus days. That's the first thing. Rebalance if it gets within 75. The second thing, the delta, higher the better, but something with a SPY you could probably do much better than um, a 50 delta. You could probably get much higher than that. But uh, with volatility ETPs, sometimes we use 50 delta, sometimes 60 if we can push it. But the higher the better, so you can simulate that movement. And the only thing to keep in mind is you will need a fairly large account to do this because I touched on it earlier with the price of the option. When you're doing stock replacement, if you're trading something that is at $400, you know, give or take, like the SPY is, one option contract is $40,000. So that if you don't have a large account, the difference between one contract and two contracts is very significant. There's a, a pretty large inefficiency there. So you probably want to find things that have lower dollar value but are still liquid enough. And so sometimes I default to things like the you know, the S&P 500 sector ETFs, you could use the basic materials one, you could use the consumer staples, the ones that are more stable. Don't use the energy or the financials, but you can use those more stable ones, much, much lower dollar value. And so if you have a smaller account, you can still get a, you know, quasi equity position while still having that efficiency. SPY is tough. You need a large account to do it. But, um, I agree with your point that you shouldn't use the MDY. Not that you shouldn't, there are options on MDY, but like you said, the, the SPY is more liquid. 100 plus days for sure, don't go 45 days. That's, the, the theta's already kicking in at that point. It's, if you've seen theta decay curves, sorry, it's just using my hand, but it's sort of like an exponentially increasing downward slope. Um, right around 45 or 50 days is when it starts to accelerate. So I like to keep it sort of way out on that flat part. Um, that's my style. So uh, just be careful because the efficiency isn't really there when you, you have something that's $400, you know, 40,000 per contract. It's, uh, it's quite a bit. It can, even if you can do it, the efficiency might actually cost you money. So um, I typically only do our stock replacement with our tactical vol strategy, the VXX, because typically the VXX is very low priced. So uh, that's what I would say. Um, but you can do it, of course. Stock replacement works with literally anything with a liquid options market. Just uh, be careful for those high dollar value ETFs. All right. Sorry to keep everybody 18 minutes too long. I really, really do try to keep them an hour. But um, follow me on Twitter. Give the video a like on your way out. And save your questions for next time. I promise that I will get to as many as I can. And I'll think up a good topic for next time. So. Have a great day. Thanks.